Sorry, Let's... I'm using, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best uh, sure. here. He started to share. It threatened oh, to share. I didn't realize that. Okay. Oh, good. Now all it's right, working. Is it working? Yeah, okay. we hear you. We see you. We can see your mouse pointer even. I think we're all good. Fantastic. All right, so uh, Salil is going to wrap up the workshop with a talk on models of computation reduction between algorithms. Please go ahead, Salil. Excellent. OK, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And thanks to everyone who has made it to the final talk on the final day of this workshop. It's been a fantastic time. Um, because I know that many of you are probably tired, as I am, uh, I tried to make this, this talk a little bit more entertaining and uh, easygoing. So um, you may be disappointed to not see any proofs, um, but, but you know, feel free to contact me afterwards if you want uh, to see more technical details. Okay, so let's get started. So um, the title of the talk deviates a little bit from the title as advertised on the workshop page, um, but we're gonna be talking about models of computation and specifically reductions between algorithms. Okay, so uh, in high dimensional statistics, many times we find ourselves in the following setting. We have uh, data and uh, you know, this data is, is uh, maybe takes the forms of uh, M samples and, uh, and dimensions. So, and we think of M and N as going to infinity. And then what we wanna do is we wanna feed this data into an algorithm and then we wanna spit out conclusions, right? So you can think of problems like um, estimation, inference, or uh, for the majority of this talk, the focus is gonna be on hypothesis testing. Um, and I'll say more precisely what I mean by that later. And uh, because we are optimists, we want to tolerate data that is noisy and still have our algorithms be fast. But sadly for us, it seems that oftentimes noisier data requires slower algorithms. Okay, and now the next part of this talk is going to be like the, the next couple of slides will be very familiar. You've seen the sequence of slides in uh, many of the talks that preceded this talk at this workshop. So feel free to, you know, sing along with a chorus at home uh, if you feel moved to do so. Um, but, but what we see are these computation, <laughs> uh, what we see are these computational phase transitions, right? So um, for any given problem, we have a parameter that we call the signal to noise ratio, uh, maybe measured in terms of a number of samples uh, as it will often be in this talk, uh, or maybe it's some other, you know, like a, a quantization of the um, quality of the data. Um, and what we have is we have several phases in the signal to noise ratio. So when the signal to noise ratio is really low, the problem is impossible to solve. And then we see another phase. Uh, so, so by impossible, I mean information theoretically impossible. Like uh, you cannot, you know, distinguish your data from random noise. Uh, and then we see another phase where uh, we uh, conjecture that the problem is hard. Okay, so what this means is that even though information theoretically, there are good estimators, we don't know any estimators that run in polynomial time. Uh, and then finally, there's a regime where, where the problem becomes easy, meaning we have polynomial time algorithms to solve this. And, and we've seen this occurring over and over again in this workshop. Essentially, every talk has been exactly about this topic. Um, so I've listed many problems here, but uh, I'm going to use planted clique as kind of the model uh, problem for the rest of this talk. Okay, so plan of clique, uh, probably we could all uh, define this, but I'm going to, to do it anyway, just because this talk is being recorded. So um, for those of you watching at home, uh, in plan of clique, we have the following problem. We have the null distribution, which is just an erdos rainy graph GN half. So this means I have a graph and every edge is included independently with probability half. Okay, and in the alternate distribution, I have uh, again g and half, but in this case, I take a set of k vertices and I plant a clique on them. So this is a k clique. And then for the remaining uh, edges, they're all included again with probability half. Okay. And our goal is to hypothesis test between these two distributions. So what this means is that I get a graph and I want to decide if it more likely came from the Erdos-Rainier distribution or from my alternate distribution, 
with a plantain cake leek. So here the signal to noise ratio is typically measured by K, the size of the plantain cleek. Okay, and the phase diagram looks like this. If the cleek has size smaller than two log N, it's impossible to hypothesis test. Then if the cleek has size between two log N and root N, uh, the problem is conjectured to be hard. Okay, and then above root n, there's, a, there's an algorithm. So the problem becomes easy. All right, so, so that's a story with point and clique. But what we want is we, we don't want just conjecture. So, okay, so, so why do I say conjectured hard? I guess, I guess it's because we have evidence. So the point is that we want evidence for hardness uh, in the conjectured hard regime. So what is our evidence? Oops. So, okay, our, our, if, if we turn to classical complexity theory, one thing we might be tempted to do is to have uh, reductions, right? So in classical complexity theory, we have the space of all problems. And then what we do is we uh, say that one problem is just as hard as another problem if there's a polynomial time algorithm that reduces from one problem to the next. Um, and uh, we, we like to arrange problems into these equivalence classes, such as the equivalence class of NP-complete problems by saying that they're all, you know, pairwise uh, polynomial time reducible to each other. But if you imagine trying to do, to do this for, for statistical problems, I mean, this is exactly the topic of, of Guy's talk uh, just before mine, the, the situation gets much trickier and the, the reductions get much more complicated. Um, and then let me just repose one of the challenges that was mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, Imagine a reduction from uh, a plantain clique on a G n half to plantain clique on G n one quarter. Okay, so so in terms of how difficult we believe these problems to be, we believe them to be essentially equivalent. But it's difficult to imagine a polynomial time reduction from one problem to the other. Um, another thing that you could ask is, can you get a reduction from plantain clique to Ksat? Okay, so, so these are like the average case analogs of uh, max clique and uh, let's say three set. Uh, it's very easy to reduce between these problems in polynomial time. Um, in the worst case, it's one of the things like the first reductions that you, you know, teach to an undergraduate um, in a, you know, introductory complexity class. But for the average case version, it seems like a, a challenge that's beyond the current day techniques. Okay, so, so most of our evidence uh, at least in the present day, comes from a different approach. Uh, and that approach is ruling out restricted models of computation. So what do I mean when I say restricted models of computation? Here I basically mean classes of algorithms, right? So um, we've seen many, I mean, there, there are many classes of algorithms, but there are kind of a couple of, uh, you know, favorite uh, problem classes or uh, models of computation that, that are used throughout, uh, you know, statistics for statistical problems. So just, just to point out the ones featured in this workshop, which are also kind of the, the main popular ones, we have things like spectral algorithms. So here you can think of simple things like computing the covariance matrix or maybe things based on the non-backtracking spectrum. Uh, um, we have things like uh, convex programs, so this can this can include you know sophisticated uh, convex programs such as sum of squares or, or kind of uh, less powerful programs such as linear programs. But but I want you to basically think of sum of squares throughout this uh, talk. Um, we have statistical query algorithms, which I'll tell you more about later. Uh, low degree polynomials, which was the focus of Alex's talk. Um, Gradient methods here, you can think of things like Longevin dynamics, uh, MCMC methods here, you can think of things like the Glauber dynamics. And we saw talks about that this morning from Subhabrata and uh, Elias and uh, message passing. And here I mean things like approximate message passing or belief propagation or uh, even the Kikuchi message passing method. Right. So, so when we want to show that a problem is hard, when we want to get evidence for hardness, basically what we do is we show that all our models are stuck. Okay, so uh, for example, for the problem of planted clique, 
uh, in uh, 92, and then uh, Jerem proved that you need the clique to have size at least uh, root n in order for Markov chains to work. And then this was uh, refined a little bit more recently by um, uh, David and Elias. And then uh, same for message passing, uh, Deshpande and Montanari showed that you need the plain clique to have size at least root n. For spectral algorithms, uh, the kind of uh, known spectral algorithms are stuck at root n. For statistical query algorithms, because of some issues with model specification, uh, this isn't this, there is a reduction from planted clique to, to statistical queries that show that you need uh, at least k to be at least root n, but um, it's for a kind of bipartite version of the planted clique. So this this will I will circle back to this towards the end of the talk, um, but there's some kind of evidence that you need the clique to have size at least root n. Uh, for convex programs and for low degree polynomials simultaneously, we also need k to be larger than root n, as shown by uh, Barak et al. Um, in their paper, which, which shows that you need, you know, uh, quasi-polynomial size convex programs to solve planetically. Okay, so so this is this is it. We we have a problem. We want to show that it's hard in the hard regime. We eliminate one of each of our models of computation one by one, and then we say, okay, well, uh, looks like if we're going to beat the current signal to noise ratio at which we can solve this problem, we're going to need a, a drastically new algorithmic technique. Okay. All right. So. That's that's the state of the art, basically. Um, you know, for each problem, we what we do is we eliminate all of our models of computation, and uh, this is uh, this is sort of an unfortunate uh, you know situation that we find ourselves in. I think, like, you know, imagine that a new important problem pops up today: uh, vaccine verification, whatever that means. Okay, what we have to do is we have to go problem by problem and say. Markov chains can't solve it. Message passing can't solve it. Spectral algorithm can't solve it. You know, and and what we what we would kind of expect is like, okay, well, I eliminated one algorithmic method, and like all of these things are kind of the same, uh, like in their performance. So you know, if I if I did one, like I shouldn't have to do all of them, uh, right? Like if we think of this as a as a bipartite graph with uh, like n models of computation and n problems. Like this requires us to write O of M N papers, but uh, but maybe there's a better way, right? So, what if we could instead? Are, 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 yeah, slow, are, are you trying to minimize the number of papers we are going to write? <laughs> yeah, I, I am. <laughs> I mean, okay, you know, you can do whatever you want, but um, okay, so so yeah, so so what if there was a different way, right? What if we could show that these algorithms have roughly equivalent performance for all these problems for a reason. What if we could show that, uh, let's say, low degree uh, polynomials and spectral algorithms have equivalent performance for uh, many, if not all, of the statistical problems that we care about? Um, and similarly, uh, you know, we could we could relate spectral algorithms to Markov chains to message passing and backwards, right? And now, if we do this. All we have to do is we start with, with our favorite problem, let's say planet clique, and we only have to rule out one of the methods. And then once we rule out one of the methods, we get to rule out all of them, right? So, so now, yeah, for, for each problem, you can pick you know, your, your favorite uh, method of, of finding lower bounds, you know, something like this, right? And now we only have to write order of n plus m papers. So to, to recycle a joke that I used in a previous iteration of this talk, um, one time my, my uh, dear friend Sam Hopkins explained to me the business model of Iceland Air. Okay, so, so what does Iceland Air have that no one else has? They have an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? And so if there's N cities on the Atlantic and M cities in Europe, they only need order N plus M planes, right? Just to fly back and forth to the island uh, in the middle of the Atlantic. Whereas United has to buy N times M planes, right? One for every pair of cities uh, on the Atlantic versus Pacific, or I mean, sorry, the two sides of the Atlantic. And so, and so what we really want to do is we want to be, we don't want to be like United, right? We want to be like Iceland Air. We want to be efficient and, uh, you know, save our, our work uh, for, for uh, you know, 
the most interesting uh, problems that we we can think of, right? So, okay, so that's the dream. Ryan made a face. I really wanted the laugh track queued up, but somehow that punchline didn't quite land. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many good ones before, like I missed the opportunity. Oh, I see. Anyway, I see. Okay, yeah. I thought I said I thought it was something I said. No, no, you should just bring your own like air horn or something. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, go on. All right, so so anyway, so this is the dream, okay, and and uh, and it is it is a, a very ambitious dream, and I I don't know if we're going to be able to realize it quite like this, but there are some modest steps towards uh, realizing this dream, okay, that that have been happening uh, recently. So, um, I want to mention just a couple of of works because I um, consider these to be the ones that capture kind of the largest classes of uh, statistical problems. Um, so I'll talk today about a work that relates uh, convex programs to some subclass of spectral algorithms. And uh, this is a joint work with um, Sam Hopkins, Pravesh Kathari, um, Aaron Patechen, Prasad Govendra, and David Stoyer from Fox 17. Okay, so we'll see this result a little later. I also want to mention a work that uh, reduces some subset of convex programs, so some restricted class of convex programs, to statistical query algorithms. So this is by uh, Feldman, Guzman, and Vimpala, also from 2017. I won't have time to, to talk about uh, this today. Um, and then uh, after spending a little bit of time on the um, spectral algorithm and convex program equivalents, I'll talk about statistical query algorithms and low degree polynomial equivalence. Uh, and this is based on some really recent work with uh, Matt Bresler, or sorry, Matt Brennan, Guy Bresler, uh, Sam Hopkins, Jerry Lee, uh, now available hot off the presses on archive. Okay, and, and then there's a, there's a somewhat um, different approach as well, but I consider that to be part of this, this general umbrella of, of getting reductions between the algorithm, which is to understand what kind of hard structures um, mean that these algorithms fail. So we saw a couple of talks this morning about the overlap gap property. Um, you know, doing things like saying if there is an overlap gap property, then low degree polynomials fail, um, or message passing fails, or Markov chain fails. Um, I think I think this is uh, it's not exactly the same, but I think this is also you know part of the same general idea of having reductions between algorithms, or at least understanding you know, what structures are there that make all these algorithms fail uh, commonly. So I guess I should at least uh, cite um, Gamarnik, uh, Jagannath, and Wine for these uh, overlap gap reductions. Okay, so, so the plan for the rest of, of the talk today is going to be to see at least what this result, uh, which reduces SOS to spectral algorithms is, um, and, and vice versa. And then uh, also to see the statistical query versus low degree polynomial reduction. And I'm going to spend the majority of my time setting this up. Here I'm only going to give you a, a little taste um, of what's going on. Um, but let me try to encourage you to view the technical portion of this talk with uh, soft eyes. So to explain what I mean, uh, I'm going to make a, a big risk here and I'm going to try to play a video for you all. So let's see. Okay. All right, let me know if it's working. It's probably not working. It's not working. We're frozen on, who is it, Bunk and Kimo? Yeah, let me try again. Oh, there we go. No sound though? Oh yeah, sound's not on. All right, sorry, sorry. Probably there's some way to play YouTube via Oh, it's good. Go back to the beginning yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I knew, I knew this would happen, but it's worth it for the... <laughs> okay, let's go. Rubble gloves. Soft eyes. Like I'm supposed to cringe. You got soft eyes, you can see the whole thing. You got hard eyes. You stand at the same tree, missing the forest. Uh, Zinj. Soft eyes, grasshopper. 
All right, so uh, hopefully that was at least mildly successful and you got some of the point of that video. But the point is that you, you, should, you should look at these results with, with kind of soft eyes and try to see, you know, they're explaining power and, and, and see kind of like the, the general uh, picture. And then if you feel so inspired, you can go later and check the papers on archive and or uh, message me or one of my co-authors. Um, okay, so that's enough uh, philosophy for now. So let me tell you a little story about uh, sum of squares and spectral algorithms. This is just to kind of set the stage for what's going on. So uh, back in the in the you know mid 2000 aughts or the early 2010s, uh, this the sum of squares algorithm was uh, just becoming popular. And for worst case problems there was this feeling that sum of squares is really much more powerful than spectral algorithms or, or many of the other uh, algorithms that came before it. So for example, for problems like three coloring in worst case graphs, uh, there were advances using the sum of squares uh, convex programs that, that just seemed like impossible to match with, with uh, spectral algorithms, right? I mean, it wouldn't even be, like, it wouldn't even make sense to try to match them with a spectral algorithm. Um, but, but somehow there weren't that many algorithms that were coming out where sum of squares was really uh, improving the state of the art results in, in polynomial time. And then circa 2012 and uh, uh, the couple of years afterwards, a couple of works came out which, which showed that sum of squares was making uh, big gains for, for several statistical problems. So really pushing the signal to noise ratios at which uh, problems were able to be solved. And I just put a, a smattering of examples up here. Um, this isn't supposed to be a comprehensive list. There wasn't that much room on the slide. Um, but for things like tensor decomposition or dictionary learning or tensor PCA, uh, some of squares was really introducing algorithms that were substantially beating the previously considered algorithms. But then in around 2016, it turned out that many of these uh, some of squares algorithms were actually able to be matched with spectral algorithms. Um, so you have a, a spectral algorithm, which isn't doing any optimization over sort of a, a convex uh, body uh, that is nonetheless approximately matching the performance of some of squares. I don't, I don't mean exactly. I mean, in some of the cases there were legs. And then here also, there were a couple of papers that I, I maybe um, could have written and, and didn't. Um, but you know, uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that, that these spectral algorithms weren't sort of your vanilla sort of uh, spectral algorithms, right? So like uh, traditionally, uh, what does a spectral algorithm look like? You know, you have a bunch of samples uh, in let's say uh, n dimensions, and then uh, you make their covariance matrix, right? And then you evaluate its top eigenvalue or top eigenvector. Or uh, maybe your input is like a tensor, like a, you know, n by n by n tensor, and uh, you flatten it out into a rectangle, like an n squared by n rectangle, and then you take the, um, you know, top eigenvector, top eigenvalue of that. Okay, but these new algorithms were a little bit fancier. So uh, what they would do is, is they would take the data, and then they would make a matrix whose entries were like higher degree polynomials of that data, right? So let's say like a if we look at uh, this uh, paper for the tensor decomposition problem, the entries were degree seven polynomials of the input tensor. Okay, so 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 the spectral algorithms were a little bit different than, than the ones that had been seen before, and they were inspired sort of by the analysis of some of squares. Um, and you know. The question was, you know, is this is this phenomenon uh, an isolated incident, or is there like a deeper explanation for why this is happening? That, that the big, powerful sum of squares relaxations are being matched uh, by, you know, these these supposedly weaker spectral algorithms. Okay, so it turns out that uh, in in this work with uh, Hopkins, Katari, Patechin, Rikavendra, and Steuer, we were able to give a theorem which explains that for a large class of uh, statistical problems, the success of degree D sum of squares implies that there's a algorithm running in time roughly n to the order D, uh, which does just as well 
Okay, so, so in order to um, explain this theorem, let me kind of introduce the three main characters of the theorem, which are degree D sum of squares, degree D spectral algorithms, and uh, robust uh, noise robust planted problems. Uh, also, feel free to interrupt me for questions at any time, I should say. Okay, so, so degree D sum of squares. So we've seen this uh, in, in previous talks at the workshop, but let me just refresh you briefly on what this means. So we say we have some polynomial optimization problem. Uh, you know, let's try it. Let's say we're, we, let's call it A and it takes as input some, some G. G is supposed to evoke a graph adjacency matrix here, for example. Uh, and it's trying to maximize some polynomial in G and uh, some variables X subject to some polynomial constraints. Okay, so, so we start with some polynomial optimization problem. I want you to think, for example, of Max Clique, which, uh, which if you think about it for a couple of minutes, you can see that you, know, you can formulate as a polynomial optimization problem in the graph uh, description. Uh, and then the sum of squares uh, relaxation at degree D is kind of the uh, best uh, semi-definite programming relaxation for A of size uh, n to the order d. OK, so, so here I've, I've, I'm leaving things vague. Remember the soft eyes. Um, but let me just say that, that for a, a large class of, of uh, problems, we know that this best is actually uh, literally the best. Um, so for example, you can look at the work of Lira Govendra and Stoyer. Uh, from 2015. Okay, so that's what I mean by degree D sum of squares. Now, let me introduce a class of spectral algorithms, so a restricted class of spectral algorithms, which I'll call degree capital D spectral algorithms. So here, uh, what I have is I have a map, a matrix value map from inputs in uh, n dimensions, let's say, to uh, matrices that are n to the d by uh, n to the d. So if I take f of g, my output is a matrix by n to the d. And then every entry of this matrix has is a degree uh, d polynomial in the input. OK, so if my input is an adjacency matrix, uh, it's, it's some function of at most D edges in the graph. And what my spectral algorithm is allowed to do is it's only allowed to evaluate the maximum eigenvalue of F and threshold it. So, it's, so my algorithm is basically the indicator function that uh, the maximum eigenvalue of F is bigger than some threshold theta. So that's the restricted class of, of spectral algorithms that we're working with. Okay, and now uh, what algorithms are, or what, what problems are we trying to solve? We're trying to solve noise robust planted problems. So in noise robust planted problems, I have some uh, null distribution uh, over Rn. So here I only get samples G. And I have some planted distribution over uh, Rn uh, n cross R little n. So I get samples of the form GX. And the idea is that I'm going to set it up so that uh, in expectation over samples from the alternate distribution, the value of some polynomial optimization problem such as AG is much larger than the expected value under the null distribution. Okay, so, so if we think about uh, the max clique example, uh, here you would have, let's say, the null distribution be erdos rainy graphs, and the alternate distribution be a joint distribution over pairs of graphs and indicators for where the planted clique is, right? And, and this, this uh, planted solution witnesses the fact that the value of this polynomial optimization problem is much larger uh, in the alternate case than in the null case. 
So, so that's the that's the general setup. What do I mean by noise robustness? I mean that this continues to be true. So this should still be true uh, if I apply noise from uh, d0 to d1. Right, so what this means is uh, for planet clique, for example, you can imagine that you take your graph of the planet clique and then you choose some random subset of the vertices that you're going to keep as is. And then every edge that is outside of that subset of vertices, you re-randomize it. So when you do that, you're still going to have a large planted clique inside, right? So you can apply noise and the optimization problem uh, is still robust. There's still a much larger maximum clique in the alternate distribution versus the null distribution. Okay, so supposing that, uh, so, so now that, that I think this introduces all the characters and, and now we can say the, the theorem. So, okay, so what we proved is the following. So if the degree d sum of squares uh, program or relaxation for this optimization problem distinguishes our null distribution from a noisy version of the alternate distribution, then there's also a degree order epsilon d spectral algorithm which distinguishes the original distribution. So if sum of squares solves a slightly harder problem, the noisy problem, then a spectral algorithm will solve the original problem. Um, okay, so so roughly that's the that's the statement. Uh, let me just say that the proof is non-constructive. So that that makes this feel a little bit unsatisfying. I mean, it's not really like a reduction between algorithms per se. Like it's not like I produced for you the the spectral algorithm for you to run uh, by hand, and it's it's furthermore like not even guaranteed that the same spectral algorithm will work for every value of n that you choose. Um, but still, you know, we are explaining with a theorem this uh, seeming equivalence that we observed in, uh, in practice, so to speak. Um, and, and also, I just want to say that this, this setup is sort of rich enough to capture several of the problems that, that we care about. So many problems that we care about. So every, for example, plants and clique, uh, as I've been alluding to, uh, also, uh, tensor PCA, uh, community dissection, etc. All right, maybe it's good to pause for questions. No questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, okay. Is it possible that this framework could be used to prove SOS lower bounds? Like maybe you give a family of uh, matrices and then if you can bound the spectral norm of every matrix in this family by some number. It, yeah. Like, like in principle, it sounds like such a thing is possible, but. Yeah, this is an, this is an excellent question and I'm going to answer it, but um, I hope, I worry that my answer may only be comprehensible to experts. So if, if I lose you during the answer to this question, don't be worried. Um, the issue here is that we're not looking at the maximum, uh, the maximum absolute value of an eigenvalue. We're looking at the maximum positive magnitude eigenvalue. So, so if you were looking at the maximum absolute value eigenvalue, then, uh, then you could probably, you know, I mean, I think it would be pretty immediate to get lower bounds. But, but because the class is defined in this way, I actually don't know how to show lower bounds against this class of spectral algorithms. Um, so. So it's a little, yeah, it's a little tricky, but it's, it's possible that it would be a way to prove uh, SOS lower bounds. Cool, cool. Okay. Can I ask also, um, so though, like you said, this uh, particular strategy is not constructive, the original kind of phenomenon that motivated this was a constructive relationship, right, between SOS, at least proof techniques and, uh, and these uh, these polynomial like spectral methods, right? So, do you think that there's some hope to kind of analyze the situation differently, such that this does become constructive? I think that would be fantastic. Um, I, I myself don't know how to do it. Um, yeah, uh, but but I think it would be great if you could have a black box result of that form. 
Can I ask a really naive question? So what about spectral algorithms where I limit the size of the matrix, maybe even to the original size of the instance, but then, but I have arbitrary element wise, oh. uh, 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 an arbitrary function, which is applied to the elements. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. What you can do there, actually, it's, it's, uh, if, you, if you're allowed to apply an arbitrary function, what you can do is you can say, evaluate the likelihood ratio in just one entry, right? So you can have a one by one matrix where you're doing like the optimal hypothesis test. Um, and then like, you, that I mean, that is a that is a very powerful class of spectral algorithms. I'm saying, um, so. I mean, do, do we have lower? Do, do we know that that type of algorithm doesn't work for you know Gaussian submatrix localization, for instance, in a certain range? I think that that type of algorithm should probably work anywhere. I mean, you can just evaluate the information theoretic. Like, right, if there's an information theoretic test that works information theoretically, you just take it and then put that as your function in the input of the matrix. So, so like oh, but no, I, that, I, I, yeah. but I, I mean, a, a much more restricted thing. I, I, I take so the, sorry. I take the entries of the instance and I apply the same function to each. Oh, entry I'm sorry. And okay. then just look at the spectrum of the resulting matrix. Um, and the function has to be the, the, function of only that entry, or it can be a function of all of the entries? Just that one entry. I mean, it's a very limited class, but but I, I'm not limiting the degree of the poly, I'm not saying it's a polynomial degree D. It could be some crazy transcendental thing. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. I would have to think about it, but my guess is that would not be a very powerful class. Um, Uh, okay, great. Anyway, um, so thank you for the questions. Oh, Ryan, are you, you're unmuting There yourself. was one question from Chris Jones. I don't know if it got answered properly. He's on the call, I think. It was answered correctly. Thank you. Okay. That was Sidon's question. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Go ahead. Cool. Okay, so now um, we move on from, from this part. Uh, and now I just wanted to, to kind of uh, say a little bit more philosophy of how we could possibly make, make these uh, dreams come true. And I think that there's a lot of promise to considering low degree polynomials. So I, uh, I really love uh, low degree polynomials. And let me tell you a couple of the, the reasons why. Okay, so one reason is that they capture many algorithms. So I, Alex went into this uh, in great detail uh, yesterday, and it was, it was an excellent talk. So I, I'm just uh, going to, you know, very vaguely say that we know that many uh, spectral methods can be reduced to low degree polynomials. Uh, same with some subclass of message passing algorithms. Uh, and there's even some sense in which uh, convex programs may be reducible to low degree polynomials. So this is following the work of uh, Barak at all um, for a uh, planted clique. So, so there, there, is a, there is some hope that one could use low degree polynomials as the kind of uh, like a uh, Iceland of, uh, of our, um, you know, like uh, airline, right? We, we, could, we could just try to show that all of these methods are equivalent to low degree polynomials. Um, it, it's possible that it would work. Uh, another reason why I like them is because they sort of have explaining power. So in the sense that the failure of low degree polynomials, it's almost a structural property in itself because it's a statement about the low degree moments of the distributions that you're considering, the null and alternate distributions being uh, too close to tell apart. So, so it's, it's not something like a, it's not a geometric property, but at least it's an algebraic property that um, is more concrete and maybe easy to check than uh, saying that, you know, sum of squares programs can't distinguish these two things. Um, and then finally, I think that they're uh, pretty easy to work with in many cases. So, you know, if you, if you come and you tell me um, you know, here is the vaccine verification problem. Prove to me a sum of squares lower bound for this problem. I will say, ugh, like <laughs> it's going to take me a while. 
Okay, but but if if I just have to prove that the low degree moments are not easy to distinguish, it might be a calculation that only takes you know an hour or an afternoon. Um, that's not always the case, but but typically uh, they're more approachable to work with. So I think that you know if we're focusing on uh, kind of connecting this graph, um, low degree polynomials are a good bet to be to be working with. Um, okay, so so then for the rest of the so that was, that was my little pitch for low degree polynomials. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about the um, correspondence between statistical query algorithms and low degree polynomials. Um, and I see that I don't have a ton of time left, so it might be a little bit uh, hasty, but hopefully that's all right. All right, so this is a this is a new paper that uh, we just wrote with Matt, Guy, Sam, and Jerry. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about this work and I was very happy to be working with this fantastic team. We had a, we had a lot of fun uh, this summer. Um, so yeah, and what, what we do is we basically show that statistical query algorithms and low degree tests are almost equivalent. Okay, the operative word being uh, almost, but, but it's not, I mean, the almost is, is uh, precise enough that we're able to get a lot of uh, lower bounds for free. So. Uh, for example, we're able to get uh, tensor PCA lower bounds that already exist for low degree polynomials to imply uh, statistical query lower bounds for tensor PCA. Uh, same thing for uh, random three set and uh, sparse PCA. Um, and for a new version of planted clique, which is not bipartite. Um, uh, and uh, also we're able to get uh, existing statistical query lower bounds for Gaussian mixtures, um, and uh, robust mean estimation to imply a low degree polynomial lower bounds. So, uh, so here, like, if you look at the paper, you can look at it with hard eyes and really kind of like track how uh, well we are getting these uh, equivalences down. Um, okay, so, so uh, without further ado, I'll tell you about the, the setup for this uh, theorem and, and try to at least get to the theorem statement. All right, so the setting that we're interested in is hypothesis testing, as before. Uh, we're gonna have a, a null distribution over Rn. So uh, here you can think of, for example, planted clique. Uh, the null distribution would just be erdos rainy random graphs. And we'll have an alternate distribution, which is actually going to be a collection of distributions dv with a prior over the v's. So uh, this is a little bit confusing to digest at first, but Think of V, for example, as subsets of uh, N with size uh, K. And then uh, you can think of the prior mu as uh, uniform over these. And then each DV is going to be uh, G uh, N P plus a K clique on V. All right. Uh, the reason why we're doing the setup this way will hopefully become clear on the very next slide, but we're doing the setup this way. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure, uh, what we're going to see is we're going to see M samples either from uh, the null distribution or from some specific DV sampled from you, right? So, so the point is that all M of my samples come from the same uh, distribution in the alternate distribution class. And the reason why this is happening is because of the way that statistical query algorithms are defined. Um, so yeah, again, on the very next slide, hopefully this will be clear. And our goal is going to be to design an algorithm which minimizes the probability of saying that we have the alternate distribution under the null uh, class plus the probability that we um, are saying that we have the null distribution under the alternate class. So this is just minimizing type one plus type two error as usual. Okay, so what are statistical queries? So statistical queries is a uh, Oracle model for access to a distribution um, that, that is as follows. So uh, what you have is you have any bounded function from uh, Rn that is a single sample to zero one. Okay, you can take this function, you can feed it to an Oracle, which is a statistical query Oracle. In this talk, we're going to focus on Vstat. Uh, there's a, a number of different Oracles with different guarantees, but sort of Vstat is a, maybe like the, the state of the art. And uh, what Vstat will do is, uh, and it takes it takes some parameter m. And what Vstat will do is it will tell you the expectation of this function 
under the distribution in question on a single sample up to an error, right? So, so this error is an adversarial error, uh, but it's supposed to mimic the uh, concentration from Bernstein uh, inequality uh, on uh, M samples. Okay, so, so V stat M basically corresponds to uh, M samples, roughly. And an SQ algorithm is an algorithm which only interacts with the data via SQ queries. So it's, it's allowed to ask Q queries to VSTAT and then it processes these queries however it likes. Okay, so our proxy for run, running time is gonna be entirely uh, the number of queries. So we've replaced running time with query complexity. And our proxy for the signal to noise ratio is uh, M, this parameter, which roughly corresponds to the number of samples. Okay, so uh, what's, what's an example of a commonly used statistical query algorithm? Well, one such example is the method of moments. Right, so in the method of moments, what you do is uh, you have a bunch of data um, and what you wanna do is you wanna compute moments of it. So like a phi of uh, X would be expectation of X to the S, let's say. Um. So Lynn, just, a, just a question. Uh, can, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, just a question because I'm not like super familiar with the uh, SQ model. Like uh, this is not the bounded function, right? The moment is it? Uh, yeah, sorry. You would, you would, uh, so it depends, it depends where you are. Like uh, maybe like if you're in a discrete district, like over the hypercube, the moments are bounded. Um, but, but you could, okay. oftentimes you can deal with these things by applying some threshold like, uh, Okay. Like so that's your perspective. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Great questions. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Uh, I'll move on, but if anyone is confused, feel free to interrupt at any time. Okay. Our second model is going to be low degree tests. So we've heard a little bit about these in the workshops. Um, but what we're going to have is we're going to have a polynomial in all M of the samples. Uh, and the polynomial is going to have bounded degree. And we'll choose some threshold, which is going to be a real number. And our low degree test is just going to be checking if the polynomial evaluated on the data is bigger than some threshold value theta. right? And, and we're hoping that the answer is going to be 1 in the planted case and 0 in the null case. All right. now. Uh, let me say something about uh, what kind of notion of bounded degree we're going to have, because it's going to be a little bit different than what Alex was discussing yesterday. So uh, we have this notion that we call the sample wise degree. So we say that polynomial is sample wise degree DK if uh, when you look at the matrix of uh, data, so the n by m matrix of data where each uh, data point is a column xi, uh, it has sample wise degree dk if it uses at most k columns. So every monomial only touches at most k columns or samples. And uh, every monomial uses at most d uh, entries of a sample. Hey, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So if I'm thinking about planted clique, for instance, are these M independent draws from the distribution of graphs with the planted clique? And do they have the same planted clique over and over or a new uniformly random planted clique in each, in each one? Yeah. So, okay. So I, I'll say more about that a little bit later, but, but yeah, already you should start to feel a little bit uneasy. Like it doesn't seem like my favorite problem is going to be captured by this uh, hypothesis testing framework, but, but I'll, I'll bail you out in a, uh, like uh, four slides, maybe, maybe only two slides. Um, okay, anyway, so, so this is gonna be my notion of degree and, it, and it's uh, equivalent to the usual notion of degree up to a quadratic factor, right? Like a, a degree, sample wise degree DK polynomial has a degree DK at least over, um, let's say like the hypercube. Uh, yeah, so, 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 okay, so now my, uh, and, and the reason that I'm going to do, so, so you can just feel free to think of it as like degree D times K for this, but for the proofs, it's easier to have this uh, sample wise degree notion. Um, and, 
Okay, so, so what's our proxy for the running time? Well, it takes time n to the d times m to the k to evaluate such polynomials. I think, I think we just don't see, I, oh, okay, just updated, I'm sorry. Okay, I just couldn't see before the uh, updates. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, uh, yeah, please let me know if that stops happening because uh, it would be, would be good to know. Okay, so, so our proxy for the running time is going to be the time to evaluate the polynomial, right? So that's something like uh, n to the d, m to the k. And our proxy for signal to noise ratio is again going to be um, the number of samples. Okay, and, and we already said uh, a couple of, of examples of, of uh, low degree tests, or we saw them yesterday in Alex's talk, but um, for example, spectral algorithms are often low degree. Uh, so one way to see this is that um, if you look at the algorithm that takes, for example, the adjacency matrix of a graph and evaluates its top eigenvalue, uh, what you do is you would take the adjacency matrix, which is which has degree uh, one in your input. You take the trace of a health power of this, and then uh, this is supposed to be something like the maximum eigenvalue to the L, and now you can apply some threshold. Okay, so, so it has sample-wise, I guess, degree uh, L uh, one. Okay. So, okay. So what we were hoping for is to say that uh, the two K query uh, Vista uh, um, algorithms are equivalent to M sample uh, degree order K uh, polynomial or tests. Right. This would this would sort of uh, make the running time and uh, uh, like uh, um, signal to noise equivalent roughly between the two models. But there's there's a problem of model mismatch. So one problem is that. Sometimes statistical queries are much more powerful than low degree tests because uh, the functions that we can ask to the oracle can be uh, inefficient, can be hard. For example, you can have uh, your function be the indicator that uh, G contains a cake leak. Okay, so, so that, that looks really bad, right? Um, and, and uh, another issue is that sometimes uh, low degree tests can be more powerful than statistical queries. Is and the reason for this is that the queries can only see one sample at a time. At a time. Uh, whereas the polynomials, remember, we, we have the sample wise degree dk, so they can have monomials that are a function of k sample simultaneously, right? So that, that gives some additional power. And uh, let me just give you an example where this means that polynomials perform better than statistical queries. So one such example is if your null distribution is uh, equations uh, over uh, f p to the n, and your alternate distributions are uh, equations over the same space, but uh, with pointed solutions. So uh, if I allow a degree uh, n, n polynomial, then it can solve this problem with Gaussian elimination. Uh, and n is pretty large, but, uh, but you realize that there's no dependence on p. Okay, whereas it's, it's not too hard to show that uh, you need p to the n uh, queries to a VSTAT algorithm. Um, and if I send P to infinity faster than N, then uh, my, my low degree polynomials are beating uh, my statistical query algorithms. Okay, so, so there's some kind of a mismatch between these two models, but basically what we're able to show is that if you rule out these, uh, these uh, two settings, like when neither of these issues arises, the models are equivalent. So when these don't arise, these uh, don't happen we get an equivalence. Okay, 
Okay, now is the point where I'm going to address Chris's question, which is, wait a minute, like a uh, planet clique is my favorite problem, but you just told me that statistical queries don't make sense for planet clique. So like, what's up with that? Um, well, uh, what we can do is we, we can do the following. So our, so our issue is that if a single sample is enough to information theoretically distinguish, then statistical query algorithms can essentially, uh, you know, like evaluate the likelihood ratio on that one sample and uh, apply some thresholding to it. And then based on that, it can, can automatically distinguish. But many of the problems that we care about are one sample problems, like for example, the plant to clique problem. So the answer uh, is to dilute the uh, alt distribution uh, so that the likelihood ratio for one sample is uh, order one, right? So um, I'll say a little bit more about that a little bit later. Uh, but but for planet clique, one thing that you can do is okay. So so and 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 the answer for how to do this uh, comes actually from the reductions uh, literature. So it turns out that if you look at planet clique, the following two formulations of the problem are equivalent uh, under polynomial time reductions. If you look at uh, G and uh, P, uh, this is equivalent to M samples from uh, G and P to the one over M. Okay, meaning that uh, if I get a sample from this distribution, I can produce M samples from this distribution. And if I get M samples from this distribution, I can produce a sample from this distribution. So, so the way to see that that happens is you just get the M samples and then you just take the AND function in every edge of the graphs that you saw. So that direction so, is kind of easy. Sorry, yeah, Andrea? Yeah, one question, but yeah, yeah I understand more or less at high level, but if you go this way, then you rule out for planted click a pretty, I don't know, a kind of strange class of algorithms, right? Are the algorithms that are statistical query after you do this reduction? That's right. So this reduction is not a statistical query reduction. Right, so, uh, so the algorithm that you can say do not work are, are these kind of strange algorithms. Are, are some, a class of algorithm that you obtain after reduction from statistical query. That's right, I mean, it's true. I think that there's no way to, because, because statistical query algorithms can solve the uh, planted clique problem, uh, there, you know, there's nothing that we can really, there's nothing we can do about that. But the question is, you know, if you want statistical queries to be a, valid proxy for polynomial time algorithms, if you want query complexity to be a valid uh, proxy for polynomial time algorithms, what condition should you meet, right? So I'm saying, well, you know, at minimum, we should should meet this condition that the likelihood ratio for a single sample is order no, one. I understand, I understand yeah, yeah. where you come from. Right, okay, so. Cool. Uh, great, so uh, yeah, so, so for plan to click, you do something like this. For Gaussian pro problems, it's, it's also easy to do the same thing. So for example, you'd replace uh, tensor PCA uh, where uh, your samples come from uh, a spike with, uh, with strength lambda. These are equivalent to uh, M samples from uh, spike with strength lambda over root m. Again, the reduction here is, is pretty easy. You just would take an average of all of your samples. Okay, so this is a way of, of sort of tying the statistical query oracle's hands a little bit so that it can't, uh, you know, cheat and do things that polynomial time algorithms cannot do. Oh, I see that I'm essentially at the end of my talk time. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so, well, okay, this is, this is a little bit unfortunate. I, I guess I can do one of two things. I can sort of sprint through definitions really fast and show you the theorem statement, uh, or I can try to conclude now. What should, what does the audience want me to do? Uh, just go ahead. Just go ahead, okay. All right, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, show that 
two notions of lower bounds for these problems are imply one another. So uh, for statistical queries, there's a statistical, there's this notion of statistical dimension, um, which, uh, which uh, I will define in a moment. But uh, the important thing to know is that if the statistical dimension at tolerance M, SCAM, is bigger than Q, then a statistical query algorithm needs at least Q queries to V stat order M. Okay, this was proved by Feldman et al. in 2013. Um, so even if you don't digest the definition of SCA, this is the thing that's important on this slide. Here's the definition of SCA. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I don't really have enough time to say what this was. I was hoping to give you all intuition for what it means. These are, these are the likelihood ratios. LU is like the likelihood ratio. of uh, du with respect to the null distribution. But anyway, it, it's trying to measure on what subset of the uh, support, like on what measure of the support of the um, alternate distributions are the, the distributions likelihood ratios correlated. All right, so, okay, so whatever that means. I guess we won't, I guess we won't digest what SDA means. We just know that if the SDA is large, then uh, statistical algorithms need a lot of queries. Okay, and uh, same thing with the uh, low degree likelihood ratio. So uh, here I have an M sample version of the, of the likelihood ratio norm. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's defined again uh, in terms of some, uh, <clears throat> some uh, projection of the M sample likelihood ratios. Okay, and, and yesterday Alex uh, really nicely proved in his talk that if the M sample likelihood ratio is bounded, then uh, degree D K polynomial tests can't solve the hypothesis testing problem. Okay, so, so when this quantity is small, uh, we can't solve the testing problem. Okay, and, and our main theorem is essentially as follows. Um, if the, okay, it just says that uh, if the uh, likelihood ratio, the low degree likelihood ratio is small, uh, then either the statistical dimension is, is large, appropriately large, or there's a high degree K sample test. Um, so if you wanna plug in some parameters here, uh, we're saying that uh, the like uh, polylog uh, N uh, LDLR uh, M, Order one implies that uh, SDA O tilde M is uh, N to the omega one. So in the polylogarithmic degree regime, these models are approximately equivalent unless there's a K sample uh, test of, of high degree, which is what we kind of take as a proxy for um, the fact that with very few samples, a statistical query algorithm can distinguish these by, by running a brute force uh, query. And uh, we also get a, a converse statement uh, that's essentially the same. So I'm just gonna flash it here without uh, going into to details. Okay, and, and let me just mention that for both independent, for problems with independent coordinates, so let's say that uh, D0 and D uh, U are, uh, like product measures over uh, plus minus one to the n, then we rule out these like uh, these unless conditions, right? So we can show that if there's no low degree test, then there's no high degree test for few samples. Uh, and the same thing for noise robust problems. Okay, so so for these class of problems, we get more fine statements. Um, I don't have time to tell you the proof idea. Uh, but then what that lets us do is it lets us take a bunch of uh, existing lower bounds against either statistical queries or low degree polynomials and get from them uh, with essentially no additional work, lower bounds for the other settings. So we get a lower bound, the first lower bound for statistical query algorithms from sparse PCA by going via low degree polynomials. Um, the same thing for uh, Gaussian mixtures and uh, robust mean estimation going through SQ. Um, okay. All right, so I guess I'll close with a, with a challenge, a call to action. Uh, let's, let's connect this graph. 
let's uh, find more reductions between algorithms uh, so that we can be like Iceland air. Uh, the end. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks, Tzlil. Uh Questions for Tzlil? Perhaps you've uh, answered all the questions. I, I, I have a question. Go so ahead, spectral algorithms are also message passing algorithms with a kind of uh, like linear update in the matrix you're powering up, right? So I guess there's sort of a trivial arrow in one direction there. Yeah, there's, I guess there's sort of a, I mean, it all depends on if you, uh, how you defend or sorry, how how you uh, define spectral algorithm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that in, in a lot of the cases when you're connecting the graph, and this was certainly true in, in this in this project, um, it was very important to define things properly. We flailed around for a long time trying to define things uh, properly, but then once we did, things didn't things weren't so bad. Um, so you want kind of a, like, when you're drawing these arrows, you want to draw an arrow in a way that's sort of like sufficiently broad to capture a lot of things, but not too restrictive. Yeah. I mean, a, a, a remark on that is that uh, an a major challenge, I think, is going to be, you know, giving getting definitions for each of these boxes that enable you to use the same definition for multiple arrows, right? So there's, uh, Slil already yeah. alluded to the fact that like the definition of spectral algorithms that one uses for this spectral versus SOS thing is kind of the wrong definition in some sense because it doesn't permit you, it's not the same definition as you should use to translate between spectral algorithms and low degree polynomials. And this is some very annoying, um, you know, technical failure of these, uh, of these theorems that they can't be composed. So somehow, uh, yeah, it, it's it's never it's never exactly who the right definitions are, and this is still, yeah, a mystery. So I mean, just the to the clarification because I couldn't see the statements very well, and since we talked a little bit earlier about some exponential time algorithms, like do you get also this uh, kind of correspondence? Like yeah. This? So right. So in the sub exponential, okay. Uh, in the sub-exponential regime, the issue is that you, okay, so there's this factor of k here in the denominator. So, so the statement says that uh, slightly, I mean, depending on where in the sub-exponential regime you are, a slightly less powerful uh, statistical query oracle uh, is equivalent to the low degree. Um, so, so like for example, for, for tensor PCA, we are able to get a sub-exponential time lower bound for statistical query algorithms from the low degree uh, lower bounds, but but there's like a it's slightly suboptimal in the in the exponent. That's all. I thought we are losing like constant factors in the second exponent. Like if like two yeah. to the n to the epsilon becomes maybe two to the n to the epsilon over two, something something uh, of that kind of flavor. Yeah, two to that two oh. to the n to the epsilon is like two to the n to the maybe like one minus delta times epsilon, where delta, you know, worsens as you increase yeah. epsilon. Yeah. I see. So there's some loss. There's some loss that works in the sub-exponential regime, but with some kind of painful losses. Yeah, in the in the paper, maybe um, like the statement for tensor PCA is illustrative of of the kind of loss. Yeah. There's a there's a question from Alex. Does he want to say it out loud? Oh, sure. I mean, I was just wondering whether SQ actually predicts the right sub-exponential runtime for any problems that we know of, or like what is, yeah. So, so it's, my, it's my recollection that if you try to directly bound the um, statistical query, like if you directly bound the SDA for tensor BCA, not using the low degree uh, result, then you do get the correct sub-exponential trade-off. 
Um, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I'm not confident in that. I'm going to double check again. Yeah, sorry. Um, so does, does this theorem give like the n to the k over two threshold for like random kx or set going back and forth? Yeah, so that's another so that's another good point. So it does, but but Vstat is a lower bound for uh, statistical queries. And in particular, it's not necessarily the case that it's a sharp characterization of this SQ complexity. So um, it may be the case that the statistical dimension is small, but in fact, there are no matching uh, statistical query algorithms. I see. I mean, when we wrote that paper, we had to define a different dimension, yeah. statistical dimension to get an algorithm and get a, a matching bound. And we had like vectors. Uh, right. You have this like a M stat. This M -stat. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had thought about trying to generalize this to, you know, understand the relationship with M stat, but we, we didn't look into it very thoroughly yet. I think that's a great um, question. Any more questions for Tzlil? Okay, let's thank her one more time. In the sound. Uh, friends, I think it's more or less come to an end, uh, except that um, there's one more social hour. We should all go to it. It's Friday. I mean, come on. It's in an hour and a half. I put the um, link to it up there in the chat. Uh, we should see you there. I think Peter Bartlett said he would reimburse all your drinks. So come prepared. Send him your receipts. And um, yeah, I'll hang out for a bit there uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, I'll see you there. See, see you all there. I, I really appreciate all the fantastic talks this week, including the last few. So thank you all very much. Yeah, Th likewise. thank you to the organizers. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, Super thanks nice. organizers. Thanks, you thanks Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Yeah. See you all soon.